Yeah. Before they participate. Okay. I'm done with my mouth. Yes. Um, All right. I'll do that. Okay, let's get started. Um, I just want to say a quick thing about attending in, in person. This class is meant for in person instruction. I, that is my preference because I, I like the interactions we have in class. I use the board. It's really hard with the Zoom setting and the camera for you if you are on Zoom to see the board behind me. You will not be penalized if you don't come in person, if you're attending via Zoom. Just want to make that clear. There's no penalty to that. But it's for, for your own benefit to be in class for this particular class would be good. If you don't want to do that, it's your personal choice. I just want to make it clear. I sent two reminders already that this is an in-person class from the beginning of the semester. I sent two reminders after that. So it's really, really up to you, but I'm just explaining that technology and having to teach to people in the class and people on Zoom, it's not always smooth. So I just wanna make that very, very clear to everybody. And again, nobody's gonna hold it against you if you don't come in person. Okay, I just wanna exp explain that uh, one more time. Okay, so just to uh, finish up with chromatography, general chromatography today, Let's just have, like usual, a recap questions so that we can go um, from there and finish up the last bit of this section. All right, so can you name examples of absorption chromatography? Those on, on Zoom can type in and those in the classroom can answer as well. Forms, you can give one form. Yes, can you remind me name? Megan, sorry, with the mass, it's very hard <laughs> to remember everybody. Okay, Megan, go for it. Ion exchange is one form of uh, absorption chromatography, Abby. Mm -hmm. uh, normal phase, it could be. It could be if the silica is, uh, is your excretion phase with no derivatization, and silica would be solid, so yes, it could be. Good. Uh, Chrissy? Size exclusion. Huh? Affinity is a correct answer. Size exclusion, you don't have any interactions. So um, size exclusion is just basically gel permeation. It's uh, you are separation separating based on size, not on molecular interaction. So affinity chromatography, ion exchange chromatography, a normal phase if your stationary phase is solid, and um, uh, hydrophobic interaction chromatography. There are forms of absorption chromatography. So what are the molecular interactions between the solute and the stationary phase? Always remember, there has to be some interaction. Well, if it was based on size exclusion, we just said there's no molecular interaction. But in any other form like ion exchange, what kind of interaction we expect to have between the solute and the stationary phase? Electrostatic. I was just looking at the uh, Zoom folks to count their participation as well. So electrostatic is uh, an ion exchange, yes, and that could be um, between charged uh, molecules. Okay, uh, in hydrophobic interaction chromatography, what kind of interactions do we have? Say your name first. Yes, hydrophobic interaction in hydrophobic interaction chromatography. 
How about affinity chromatography? Can you answer? Huh? Yes, there are, and there are all sorts of interactions can happen. You can have hydrogen bonding interaction, you can have electrostatic, you can have hydrophobic. So it's a very, very specific set of interactions between a solute and uh, the uh, stationary phase. Okay, so if you want to differentiate between cation and anion exchange chromatography, how would you differentiate between these two? They're both ion exchange, but how are they different? You know this, right? Just, yes, go ahead, uh, Holland. Yes, we can say it cation is it's not always protons, but you're right, in terms of protons are positive. So cations are we are exchanging positively charged uh, molecules uh, or ions. So the, the positively charged molecules are interacting with the stationary phase that would have negatively charged functional group. So your positively charged ions are being exchanged, hence cationic. And the anion are your negatively charged molecules that are being exchanged between the stationary phase that would have a positive charge functional group and your mobile. How do you increase the strength of the mobile phase? Remember, we increase the strength to enhance elution. So now that your compounds are interacting, but you want to move it up, move it out of the column faster. So you give the mobile phase something that makes it stronger. OK, so in reverse phase, how do I increase the strength of the mobile phase? You all know it, just, just be brave. Chrissy, you want to be brave? In, in reverse, is it reverse phase? Yeah, in reverse phase, actually, you start with a polar mobile phase. And then, well, thank you for your bravery. <laughs> so we start with a polar mobile phase, and your stationary phase is not polar. So to enhance the strength of the mobile phase, I increase the organic solvent. I make it less polar. So the compounds that are interacting via the, with the column via nonpolar interaction will now like the mobile phase and go out of it. So in, what about hydrophobic interaction chromatography? You remember what we said last time in hydrophobic interaction chromatography, you start with salt solution. So your proteins in the presence of salt, salt you shield their charges. So then they interact with the column via hydrophobic interactions when their charges are, are shielded by the salt. So in order to increase the strength of the mobile phase, we're starting with a really concentrated salt solution. What do I do over time? Sam? We decrease the salt concentration. Michelle, what were you going to say? Very good. So we dilute the salt concentration over time until it's basically water. In ion exchange, what do you think we do? Uh, Dylan, right? Yeah. Increase or decrease the pH? Yes, it really depends if you're doing cation exchange or anion exchange. So we either increase the pH or decrease the pH. By changing the pH, I'm changing the ionization state of my solute. If I, am, if I have a positive charge molecule and I increase the pH, that positive charge molecule is going to give up its proton or it's going to bind with the base OH minus and then you would lose that charge. So then it won't interact with the column, for instance. So changing the pH, increase or decrease, depending if I have cation or anion. And another way to do that, if I don't want to change the pH, what can I do? Yes, Al? Yes, you increase the salt concentration um, so that the salt will kind of displace your solutes from the stationary phase and they leave the column. Okay, and I see a nice a couple of answers over there um, in the chat. Good. And in affinity chromatography, what do we do? We have a really 
strong interactions between the, our molecules of interest and the ligands on the column, on the stationary phase. So I have very specific interactions. So what can I do to let it come out? Ewan? That's one way. We can change the pH or ionic strength then we can change the ionization status of those molecules, then they, we are changing how well they're interacting with the column. Dylan, you, did you want to say something? No. Say your name first. Yeah. Yes. We add a ligand similar to what's on our stationary phase so that it competes with the ligand on the stationary phase. And our molecule will now interact with the ligands in the mobile phase and it comes out. We call this specific uh, in, uh, changes in the um, or specific elution. So there is non specific elution by changing pH or ionic strength. And then you have specific elution in affinity when you target that same ligand that you have in your uh, Okay, so oftentimes too in a quiz or exam, I ask you what is the order of elution? So these questions that are recap would be really good study guides for you when you are studying because a lot of these questions would be part of your quizzes or exam. So what is the order of elution in HIC? So what, and, and I told you earlier, it's basically proteins that, uh, that are being uh, separated. So what do you think, what comes out first? What type of protein, say your name first, Melissa. The least polar will come out first. Yes, the least hydrophobic, I would say. I'm not gonna call it with polarity, I'll refer to it as hydrophobic. So the least hydrophobic will come up first because it will interact the least with the hydrophobic column. What about ion exchange? Whether it's cation or anion, what do you think will come up first? Yeah? Whatever is the least charge or the opposite charge. So if you are exchanging cations and you have anions in there, anions are just going to go out right away and not uh, be um, not interactive with them. And in size exclusion, what's the order? Let's go with anesthesia. You said the smaller? Let's see. The largest. The largest will come out first because the smallest will have access to all the pore sizes. So they'll go in and get delayed, whereas the large one won't have access to the different pores. They will come out uh, soon. Okay, good. This is good. You know this, then you're good for the quiz or the exam. All right. So moving on to the last segment of chromatography uh, or basic principles of chromatography, and Gary and GC touched on this, and I'm just going to go over the basics so that might help you also understand um, the GC portion as well. So when we run chromatography, whether it's HPLC or GC, we are aiming at separation, right? We're aiming to separate the different components. So we then either detect their presence, identify them, and or quantitate them. In order to do that, our first attempt is to get a good separation. So in order to develop the separation, so here in this example, you see two peaks not very well separated and then we can do modifications and then make sure that they get separated so that we can identify them separately. Sometimes no matter what we do, we don't get separation. We go for a more powerful technique of identification and that's the MS, which Gary is gonna talk about uh, next time. So we can either do a powerful uh, detection when we don't have separation or we can have 2D chromatography or 3D chromatography. What does that mean? So when we don't have um, good separation with uh, size exclusion, we kind of separate it, but not quite a bit. So we do the first separation by size exclusion, and then we run them on a reverse phase column, for example, and get another um, dimension of separation. But 
if you have one form of separation, one form of stationary phase, one form of mobile phase, we do the best we can to get a separation. So first of all, in order to do that as an analyst, you need to know what you are trying to separate, your components. So you try to say, okay, what are they? Are they polar? Are they charged? Uh, what are their functional groups? What are they soluble more in? Mobile phase that is organic or mobile phase that is uh, non-organic. So you start to understand what your sample is and what you're trying to separate. What are the characteristics of the components and how many components do you have to resolve? For example, not this coming week, the week after, some of you will start the mass spectrometry lab. And in that lab, we're going to separate isoflavones, which are phytochemicals that we extract from soy. There are 12 different types of isoflavones in soy. Then we know that we're after separation of 12 different peaks. Another example, we do a lot of research on a unique grain in our lab called intermediate wheatgrass. And we know that you have carotenoids in there. Out of the carotenoids, we know that two are very dominant. So I want to make sure that I can separate my zeaxanthin from what else? We've done this before. Zeaxanthin and what? Lutein. Yes, thank you. So we want to make sure that we're separating these two components that are of interest for us to determine their concentration or identity or their presence. And then we assess what degree of resolution is needed. Do we need them completely separated from each other so that we can have independent area under the curve and do a, a deep width uh, quantification? Or do I just need to know if they are there? I want to identify them and find their presence. If I just need qualitative type of data, I might accept partially separated peaks as long as I can identify each one. So yeah, any questions so far? Okay. So once I know what I'm separating, I want to choose the chromatographic separation mode. So if we're just thinking about liquid chromatography, I'm just going to say, okay, now I know what I want to separate. I know the components. I know the chem physical chemical characteristics of these components. Then I want to choose a chromatographic separation. Am I going to do reverse phase? Am I going to choose um, ion exchange? Then I, I, I really want to dig into deciding which chromatographic separation and then choose my stationary phase and mobile phase. Okay, what, what do I do first? What's the first thing I would do um, now that I know what I want to separate, what do you think as an analyst, the first thing you would do? And I think Gary mentioned it also in his lecture. You have not done this analysis before, but now you know what you want to determine. What would be, if you work in a lab, what would be the first thing you think you need to do? Yes, Al? Yes, thank you. And you look at other published work. Like Gary said in lecture, yeah, somebody must have done this before you did. So um, then you screen the literature and you see what other, what chromatographic methods people have used in the past. If there is a published method that's already published for what you want to do, you go and try it. Is it going to work 100% for you? And 99% of the time, no, you need to do modification. But at least you have starting point. So one thing I want to point out is that there's not only one choice. You will have, this is a very complicated figure, I don't expect you to know everything on that figure, but it's just to illustrate that you have many choices. So sometimes when we look at the sample we have, we look to see what are we looking at? Are we looking at big polymers or are we looking at small um, components, some small molecular weight components? And then I have choices within each uh, range. If I break the small molecules, first you have water soluble. That it could be water soluble. It could be also if your samples have relative polarity and, and they can be dissolved in methanol. 
they can be dissolved in water. So they're not necessarily totally polar or totally nonpolar. So you, you can run in this case normal phase and reverse phase. So you have a choice between normal phase and reverse phase if your solutes are soluble both in water and methanol. Sometimes you have ionic, so charge molecules. You can actually run an ionic stream, or you can run reverse phase because you can add ion pairing. That means you can add ions to your samples to pair with the charge of your constituents. Then you're masking the charge then they can interact via nonpolar interaction with your reverse phase cone. So you do have choices. So it's not always one choice. So that's basically what I wanted to illustrate with this figure. Then the way I would go is I would see what's available in my lab, what has been published before, and I start there. And then if it didn't work, I make adjustments. Maybe reverse phase didn't work. A lot of polar components are not I'm not able to separate them. I might want to try normal phase instead. Okay, so we have to make that choice. And then comes the stationary phase. So for example, with let's say if you want to do reverse phase, there is a C18 column, C8 column, C30 column. What does that mean? You can have a silica bonded to a hydrocarbon of eight hydrocarbons or 18 hydrocarbons or 30 hydrocarbons. How am I going to choose? I would choose on the basis of the hydrophobicity of my components. So C C30, for example, is mainly for very hydrophobic components like carotenoids, example. Whereas uh, the, C, um, the C30 is for carotenoids, whereas C18 is moderately uh, hydrophobic. I can use it for caffeine, like some of you already have done the HPLC then. So I choose my stationary phase and then I choose my mobile phase. I have so many organic phases I can choose, for example, with reverse phase. I can use the citronitrile or I can use methanol. So I really have to try based on the characteristics of my components and their affinity to the different organic phases. And then if things keep going on, let's say I decided on my chromatographic separation mode, I decided on my stationary phase and mobile phase. Now I need to decide, am I going to run isocratic or am I going to run gradient reaction? Rule of thumb tells you always start with isocratic. You want to know what, what's there. So you want to keep the low and the mobile phase constant and see what you get. Let's say you ran isocratic, you get good separation, but you've got broadening of the peaks because they're staying longer on the column. You potentially got a very long run, like maybe hour and a half long of run. You go, maybe I should try gradient now so that I can increase the concentration of let's say reverse phase of my organic solvent. Therefore, over I reduce my analysis time and the compounds that were eluting really late will come out sooner and I can be done in my analysis in 30 minutes instead of an hour and a half. So I start with isocratic, figure out where I'm at, and then if needed, I go with gradient. Flow rate and temperature are very, very important, as I will talk about in terms of resolution. Flow rate means how fast your mobile phase is pumped through the system. One ml per minute. Sometimes you use 0.5 ml per minute, and sometimes it's two ml per minute. So how do I determine the flow rate? Flow rate uh, helps moving. It does help move things faster, so it kind of reduces your analysis rate. Speeds up equilibrium, so you would have really narrow shaped. Um, peaks, the narrower they are, the more you can achieve resolution. I'll, I'll show that in a minute. And also, but we have to be very careful because if flow rate is very, very fast, your um, solutes are going to come sooner. They're going to move really fast and come sooner and then co-elute. So you're not giving enough time for them to separate. So we have to find the sweet spot in the flow rate. Temperature is also important. We often 
increase the temperature a little bit than room temperature to enhance analysis time. That means reduce the time of analysis and have really nice sharp peak. So with higher temperature, your mobile phase is less viscous, so it moves faster. Your solutes have a little bit more kinetic energy. They move faster. You reach equilibrium faster. Your peaks are sharper. So again, we need to figure out the best temperature, optimal temperature, without degrading our components or degrading our column or making it too fast to get good separation. So these are things that you would think of as an analyst to kind of establish your method, establish your resolution and separation. Okay, so now I'm going to switch to talk about the resolution or the separation between two peaks or several peaks. But there are certain terms that you need to know. Um, see here if I can just, what? All right. So we have what we usually define as retention volume is the amount of solvent it took for your components to leave the column. How many milliliters until you saw your comp components leave the column? We don't usually use that very often. What we use instead is the time, the retention time. So instead of determining the volume, the chromatograms give me the time. So on the x-axis, I can see the time in minutes and seconds of when my compound comes out. At the time my compound comes out, mostly um, we measure it in the middle of the peak at the highest point, that would be your retention time. We adjust the retention time often to compare between two units or two columns. Um, we adjust by taking into account the solvent front. From the time of injection to the time that you see the solvent, that means from the time you injected your sample until the detector, until that mobile phase hit the detector, you see a signal. And that time is dependent on your column length, is dependent on the length of the tubing, on how the system is set up. Uh, so that all takes into account the, uh, the solvent front retention time. So if you want a retention time that you can compare across different systems, you get the adjusted retention time, which is the retention time minus the solvent front retention time. So that is another thing that you might encounter is the adjusted retention time. Uh, so we use the adjusted retention time and retention time often to uh, identify the sample. So in the lab, in the caffeine lab, those of you that have done the lab already, we use retention time as one parameter to determine where the caffeine in our sample is based on the retention time in our standard. So that is one way we determine. And those of you that did the GC, same thing. You did the, you injected the standard that had different names, fatty acid, methyl esters, and you looked at the retention time to identify the different things. So that's a very, very common um, term that we use to identify our peaks. We can also identify the peaks on how well they are separated by something called separation factor. So the alpha, which is the adjusted retention time of peak two by the uh, um, adjusted retention time of peak one. The higher the alpha, the better the separation. So that separation factor is also something that indicates um, resolution. So now that we know these terms, we can go forward with this back and talk about the actual resolutions and the resolution and the factors that impact resolution. So one thing you want to know uh, that will help um, 
And there's that illustration on the board behind me here. One thing you want to know is that, okay, let's say this is a column. And then you have your um, stationary phase path in the column. Then you inject your sample. First thing is going to happen, you have a layer of the sample here. So a very thin layer. Okay, as the sample, as your molecules, different solutes going through your column, it's going to interact with the column and it's going to also move with your mobile phase until you reach equilibrium. And then you get to another set of equilibrium as the compound is moving forward. Gary called them different set of distillation. I would also call them different equilibriums. So there are multiple equilibrium at each point of the column or your stationary phase until your compound come out. So, and if you remember the counter current tubes that I showed you in class, the first lecture on chromatography, you had several tubes, you put your two stationary phase, the two phases stationary and mobile, you put your sample, you shift them and transfer to the other tube and transfer to the other tube. So you had equilibrium in each tube, okay? So you can call it distillation unit, or equilibration unit. So each tube represented that. So in a column, you have, instead of you having tubes, you have theoretical plates, okay? So at each theoretical plate, so let's say the column is invisibly divided into different uh, theoretical plates, which are those singular tubes that you've seen in the counter current example. And what's happening in each segment, you're getting an equilibrium between the stationary and the mobile phase as the solute is going down. So as it's going down, you see uh, spreading if by diffusion. So you're going to have, instead of a thin, you're going to have a little thicker banding because your, your solute is really diffusing down the column at the same time moving in and out with your mobile phase. So instead of having the straight line at the beginning where your sample is, it's actually going from a highly concentrated place to a less concentrated moving in diffusion, and at the same time going out of the column into the mobile phase and back in and equilibrating. So by the time your, your sample is going out, so if you have it here, let's say at the end, that translates to a specific time, here retention time, that translates to a specific retention time, and then you see a peak coming now. So here where you have the highest concentration, and then this is the beginning of the peak here down at the end of your column, when it's coming out, it's here, the beginning of the peak. And the narrower this band is at the bottom here, the narrower this band is, the narrower is your peak. So if you have good resolution and you have good capacity of the column, efficiency of the column, and selectivity of the column, which I'll talk about in a minute, you have a really nice sharp peak. If, however, I have a column that lost efficiency, if I have a column that lost efficiency, what I'm going to see here is reduced number of theoretical plates. So now equilibrium is happening over a broader area. So the number of theoretical plates got smaller and the height equivalent of a theoretical plate became longer. The height equivalent of, of theoretical plate is basically the length of the column divided by the theoretical plate. So the more theoretical plates you have, the smaller 
the shorter is your height equivalent theoretical plate. And the longer the theoretical plate is, that means you had less number of theoretical plates over time due to loss of selectivity or capacity or efficiency of the plate. So what happens here, your straight, your very thin sample as it's moving down, it's really spreading and it's becoming really large. And then this translates to a very broad peak. So now we're moving from a really thin peak to a very broad peak. So assuming I have another peak next to it, it's going to co-elute and I won't have any more separation. Does this make sense? Do you want me to repeat anything? Yes, Holland. So but these, let's say this is the initial state of the column and this is overuse. If I used it so much, I'm gonna lose some functional groups. I'm gonna lose on selectivity, lose on capacity. So over time, the equilibrium happens over a broader range or broader length of the column. So when over time, my peak that was nice and sharp the compounds are spreading over longer sides of the column because I'm not getting nice equilibrium very quickly. So then my peak, instead of being nice and sharp, it became really broad with a bigger width. And that's where I could need separation. Yes, yeah. Every column initially when it's packed, I was going to talk about this. But every column initially when it's packed, it's packed for maximum efficiency possible. So you pack the column where you have the smallest particle size possible, um, especially if it's analytical column. Separatory column is a different situation. But you would pack the column with uni uniform and small particulars, uh, particulates, minimum pores as possible in each particulate. Then, um, and sometimes also the thinner the column and the less material you have or the less stationary material you have, the more efficiency you have as well, because there's a not, not a lot of stationary phase for the sample to go in and diffuse into. So you get your start of the column, you have the maximum efficiency, you have the highest number of theoretical plates possible. But mind you, every compound has a different number of theoretical plates on the same column because it interacts differently. So there is not one column with a set of theoretical plate for every compound. So the way to determine your theoretical plate is when you get a new column, you put in a known compound, and then you determine the theoretical plates for that compound. And over time, you inject the same compound again and determine the theoretical plate. And if the theoretical plate number decreased, you know that the efficiency of the column decreased over time. And that's when you have to change your column. Okay, but I'll talk more about all of this in more detail. But what I want you to know right now is the width of the peak is very important. And the larger the width, the less resolution you're going to have. And that's why resolution here is designated with the difference in retention time over the width, the added width of the two peaks we're trying to separate. So the more difference you have between the two peaks, obviously, is directly proportional, so you have higher resolution. Okay, so so the more difference between two peaks, the higher the delta t, the difference between the two retention times of the two peaks, the, uh, oh, I was pointing on my screen. So the higher the delta t of the two, ret of the two retention times, the higher is your resolution. And the wider the peaks, that's what I'm trying to illustrate behind me, the wider the peaks, the lower is going to be your resolution. So direct relationship with the difference in retention time and indirect relationship with the, with the width 
of the peak. So if you know this, then that's great, then it will be easy to understand the next things I'm going to talk about. Okay, so which is important factor. All right, so the resolution is also related to three important parameters. So resolution is a function of efficiency. So the efficiency here is A, which is related to the number of theoretical plates. B is your selectivity, okay? Selectivity of the column. And then C is the capacity of the column. So now I'm gonna talk about efficiency, then selectivity, and then capacity, and how each one of those are going to impact the width of the peak and how well I'm able to separate my two components. Okay. All right, so this is basically what I just demonstrated on the blackboard behind or whiteboard behind me, which is the what is the number of theoretical plates. So I already explained that. And I, here I illustrated that a column, the same column, same length starts with a set number of theoretical plates. And over time, you're going to lose them because with use, you're going to lose efficiency, capacity, selectivity then your equilibrium happens over a bigger range or a bigger height of the column, which is the height equivalent of theoretical plate. With that will cause broadening of your peak, and then you would lose separation. Okay, so that's basically what this slide is showing you, is what I have been talking about and illustrating behind. So, that the use of height equivalent theoretical plate take care of differences in length of the column because columns can come in different lengths. So what's really important is how long it takes for an equilibrium to be reached. So the actual length of the distillation unit or the equilibration unit or your tube in the countertop, how long that height equivalent of theoretical plate. The shorter it is, the better is your resolution, the sharper is your peak. Now, this height equivalent of theoretical plate is a function of three components. So here we go. So here you have the height equivalent of theoretical plate. You have the mu, which is the flow rate. So this is the flow rate. And then the height equivalent of theoretical plate is a function of Eddy's diffusion, A is Eddy's diffusion, B is longitudinal diffusion, and C is your mass transfer factor. They are all important for efficiency of the column. Again, in your textbook, there is a lot of uh, um, explanation of these factors, which I will summarize here. So Eddy's diffusion, longitudinal diffusion and mass transfer. So make sure you remember these terms and I'll talk about them in detail. So you can see here what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the place where I have the lowest or the shortest height equivalent of theoretical plate. We see here that the rate or the flow rate is plays two different roles. Sometimes it causes an increase in the height equivalent theoretical plate at a high, um, at a low flow rate. And sometimes if the flow rate is really high, it causes to an increase. So I really want to find my optimum. So that means there is not, it's not all in one direction. If I have high flow rate, that doesn't always mean good. If I have very low flow rate, it doesn't always mean that it's good. So I have to find the flow rate where I have the lowest height equivalent theoretical plate. Okay, so I'm going to erase this behind me and talk about Eddie's diffusion and what it means. Okay, so let's say you have a river flowing, the water is flowing in a river. So that's the analogy I'm going to use because 
you, your column is your river. <laughs> and what's in the river usually are pebbles, stones, rocks. Okay. So, and what's in the column are your particulate of the stationary phase representing your pebbles, stones, rocks, whatever is in the river flow. So if you have a river flowing and then you have big rocks, small rocks, very small rocks. The water is flowing, so that's your mobile phase. Okay? So the water is flowing. If it hits a really big particulate or a big rock, do you think you will have multiple, more um, directions? Or less directions than when it hit a small pebble? So when you get to a small pebble, you don't have a lot of ways. The stream is not going to go in multiple ways. You're just going to maybe squirt a little bit and continue its way. Whereas if you have big particles, your flow is going to go in many, many different directions. And by doing that, I am delaying my constituents on the station phase. So I will get more spreading on the stationary phase rather than going in and out in a sharp manner without having this eddy diffusion happen. So the solution for that is packing the column with very small uniform particle size for your different um, components of your stationary phase, basically. So that's eddy diffusion. Pack the column nicely under pressure. Uh, avoid having uh, void spaces in the column. So the material is packed nicely and it's packed with uniform and small particle size material. Okay, that solves. So the smaller the A, the smaller is your height equivalent theoretical tip. Next is um, longitudinal diffusion. Longitudinal diffusion is impacted by the flow rate, as you can see here. So what is longitudinal diffusion? We already talked a little bit about it, is when your uh, sample is going, oops, when your sample is going from a very concentrated, uh, very concentrated area to a less concentrated area. So diffusing down your column is longitudinal diffusion. So going down, column in the stationary phase is longitudinal diffusion. So if my flow rate is slow, so I'm like saying 0.5 mil per minute, my sample, my components have more time on the column than in the, in the mobile phase. So I have more longitudinal diffusion rather than going in and out, getting in and out, and then leaving. So you can see here the relationship. So if I have small flow rate, so it's, this is in the, in here, de denominator, so, right, this is the denominator, okay, so it's here, so if this number is low, this is going to be high, this will increase the height, the, the height equivalent of the electrical plate, which causes the broadening. So I really need a reasonable flow rate so this longitudinal diffusion doesn't happen excessively. Okay. The last one is the, um, the transfer factor. So C is the mass transfer. So how much is going in and out rather than if I have particulates with pores? So they are going to go in, and instead of just interacting with my stationary phase and coming out, they might get inside of the pores and get further delayed. So, and then they won't, we won't get a good transfer. The transfer will be slow. If I have a very high flow rate, I would. On the opposite end, I won't get enough interaction with the column. So the, the, the high flow rate is going to carry my samples very, very fast, my components very, very fast, 
and then they won't separate properly, then I'll get also a big peak, which could be a co coelution of two or three peaks. So I don't want that either to happen. And hence, we need to find the best flow rate. Temperature effect. I talked about it earlier, but you know, finding again the temperature that gives me the good mobility, but not too fast of a mobility that would also um, hinder my separation. They come quickly, faster, and they don't separate very well from each other. So that's why flow rate and temperature are very important. So the next one is selectivity, but we got to the end of uh, today's lecture. I was hoping to finish this, but there is a couple more slides. I'll finish those on Monday. So, well, that's all for today. Have a great weekend.